In the previous chapter, we have been introduced to the basic economic theory of supply and demand. That was our economics textbook that made it sound simple and ample, which uh, professes that find out the supply, find out the demand, forecast the price. However, there is one small problem while trying to use the supply demand analysis to project prices. The problem is that demand is not readily quantifiable. There is no way to determining how much will be consumed at any given price level. Supply on the other hand can be determined relatively easily as it either remains fixed as in the case of perishable or non-storable commodities or at least roughly estimated using production and stock statistics. Well, I mean, uh, this is not always correct. There are exceptions. But in most of the cases, supply can be fairly estimated. Demand, on the other hand, is entirely intangible. There is no way to know the demand schedule. Even if theoretically we assume that we should use a statistical survey to question a representative sample of consumers about their consumption levels at various price levels, despite the fact that it sounds impractical and a an prohibitively expensive approach, our assumption that people will actually be able to even answer that question and describe their demand curve themselves is too far reaching. Try to answer that question yourself regarding any commodity of your daily use. And you'd know why such an assumption is erroneous. The only way we try to theoretically quantify demand is to infer demand curves through a detailed analysis of historical consumption and price data. This is an easy task if demand is relatively stable. However, this task becomes hugely difficult almost to the fringes of impossible if demand is subjected to frequent wide shifts. To circumvent the difficulty of quantification of demand and carry on with a workable analysis for the purpose of forecasting prices, we mostly use consumption figures as a proxy for demand. This is what we have to use due to non-availability of demand figures. The approach has a very small problem. The problem is, it is wrong. But as we have to make the mistake, we should be absolutely certain about the conceptual mistakes we have to make for the sake of an workable analysis. The consumption and the demand, although they are used as a proxy of one another, are two different concepts. Consumption is the amount of a good used and is determined by the price which in turn is determined by the supply and demand factors. Demand refers to the amount of good that will be used at any given price, uh, I mean any given price level and along with supply determines the price. Figure 6 represents an increase in demand which means that more would be consumed at any given price level. Whereas a mere price dec decline could increase consumption. So look at figure 7. In figure 7, we have this increase in demand, that is demand curve shifting to the right. And at the given price level, there is a higher consumption due to increase in demand, the likely shaded box. Whereas on the same demand curve, because price is falling, the darkly shaded box represents the higher consumption due to fall in price. Increase in demand could be induced by increase in disposable income, change in consumer tastes and preferences, price of the substitute goods coming down or going up, but by definition, not by price of the good itself. Changes 
in the price of the good itself will not cause a shift in the demand curve it will cause a shift in the consumption level of the good which is placed on the same demand curve at a much more right position of the previous consumption level <clears throat> so it does not change the demand curve itself now let us try and understand the relationship little more vividly demand is influenced by factors like income inflation population size consumer test price of substitutes supply in turn is influenced by variables like production stock levels marketing policies market selling price etc demand and supply interact to determine the price and price in turn determines the consumption level so we can say that consumption is a consequence of price and demand is a determinant of price so the use of consumption as a proxy for demand is erroneous as consumption is determined by both supply and demand a very interesting point to observe over here is in the case of fixed supply situations often found in perishable and non storable commodities consumption reflects supply and not demand for example the consumption of ripe mangoes during peak harvest season in summer of 2015 which was an year of excess supply the mangoes were selling at rupees 10 a kilo in markets near production areas of west bengal that is malda and murshidabad whereas the previous year the mangoes were selling at rupees 30 to 50 a kilo in the same area the consumption was higher in 2015 compared to 2014 but was the demand any less in 2014 did the demand for mangoes decrease in 2015 compared to 2014 the answer is no the demand did not change in either of these two years what changed was the supply 2015 being the excess supply year in the biannual cycle of heavy production years in case of mangoes and 2014 being the lean year of short supply in this case we observe that the consumption is solely determined by the supply and will be the same even if there is a shift in the demand curve the price is the variable which adjusts to bring in the equilibrium thus an increase in consumption in this case would merely reflect an increase or rightward shift in supply and a rightward shift in supply is basically a bearish development so in this case an increase in consumption is reflecting a bearish development and not showing an increase in demand which otherwise would mean a bullish development for that matter not all consumption increments reflect demand increase it is entirely possible for demand increase and consumption decrease to occur simultaneously look at figures 9 and 10 it would illustrate how this happens in variable supply as in the case of figure 9 and fixed supply situations as in the case of figure 10 at the start in period 1 the equilibrium consumption level point is a although demand curve has a rightward shift indicating demand increased in period 2 the equilibrium consumption level declines to b as a result of the leftward shift a simultaneously shift or fall in the supply curve 
so consumption cannot be a perfect proxy for demand it is an interplay of supply and demand both working together fixing on a price which is then driving consumption these few considerations about demand and consumption makes it absolutely necessary for a fundamental analyst to keep asking questions like does this statistic represent demand or it is representing consumption is this change engendered due to a demand shift or a supply shift etc such questions become very necessary while using the figures that are published worldwide and is very important to do your own inference regarding the source nature and dependability of the statistic that one is using for the purpose of fundamental analysis for example you know the USDA figures, this is a sample USDA S&D, S&D means supply and demand. The USDA figures are one of the most important component of fundamental analysis of agricultural commodities which are internationally traded. The USDA numbers are the numbers that, uh, that the world looks out for and trades and has the most impact on the price movements of the traded agricultural commodities. For this purpose, the USDA employs a huge team of economists who, due to difficulties in enumerating demand figures, use the term disappearance. Instead of the term demand. So if you look at the left hand column, you will not see the word demand in the USDA column yeah the disappearance also not there disappearance is majorly for uh, liquid commodities like oils and this is a wheat supply and use uh, balance sheet um, of USDA <coughs> so USDA supply demand figures are essentially supply disappearance figures published in the USDA reports what is disappearance it is a total domestic consumption plus exports of that particular commodity. So again we see that a large part of the so called demand figure in the USD supply demand number is actually consumption. A change in the demand or disappearance estimate done by USDA would reflect a change in consumption. This change would actually reflect a change in supply and not a change in demand. Why so? It is because the carryover figures are already estimated at a minimum pipeline requirements plus possible stockpiling at a given price situation. Now, a reduced production forecast would essentially mean that the adjustment has to occur in the domestic consumption figure or exports or both. Which essentially means that here the lower consumption is being driven by lower supply and not caused by an erosion of demand. This lower revision of disappearance figures would actually be a bullish phenomena and not a bearish phenomena. So you see quantification of demand is very difficult. So if it is so difficult that the best resources of the world cannot figure a way around it cannot we just skip the whole process, ditch demand completely from our analysis and continue with the consumption figures to do an analysis? The answer is no. In bold and capital letters. And in bold and capital letters, we need to incorporate demand in our analysis because otherwise this could lead to a big error. Demand shift is difficult to perceive. But it is a dominant force in major price movements. Let us take an illustration to understand the dangers of ignoring demand completely. Consider following pri price forecasting model. Uh, we use the price forecasting model as price as a function of uh, sub stock carryover by consumption, which is stocks to usage ratio. Uh, price is basically 
negatively correlated to stocks to usage ratio means that when stocks to usage ratio falls then prices rise to erode the consumption and keep the stocks at desired levels and if the prices are depressed whenever the stocks are higher compared to the usage prices will remain depressed to induce consumption this model works very nicely on base metals like copper but let us take a closer look at the copper market from January 1973 to December 1993 in the perspective of this model the next figure plots the average monthly copper in nearest futures prices versus the copper stocks to usage ratio for the two decades under consideration uh, the white dots the line comprising with the white dots would indicate the ratio the stocks to usage ratio and the line comprising with the black dots would indicate the price in this chart note the strong inverse correlation between the stocks to usage ratio and the copper prices in these two demarcated areas however there is a decoupling in our relationship witnessed between 1982 mid 1982 during this period we see prices are falling despite low stocks usage ratio so what is this a paradox an aberration no it is not it is a model limitation although the stocks to usage ratio is a very important fundamental indicator of prices it has the restriction of being only representative of the supply both stocks just representing the supply the apparent paradoxical behavior during this period is because the model is not incorporating demand so what happened to the demand during this period during this period the us economy anticipated and ultimately experienced a severe recessionary phase combined with high real interest rates and the combination of these two factors suppressed the amount of inventories that the users wanted to hold in other words there was a sharp downshift in demand this fundamental development despite being so so crucial to determine the price behavior cannot be incorporated into the model that we just described the moral of this discussion is that we should always consider demand and the factors that influence demand into our price forecasting analysis we are still at the problem of quantification of demand however we should still consider the impact of demand in our model qualitatively and through model projections and informal evaluation of the potential impact of the factors driving demand in the next chapter we will see possible method of incorporating demand into our fundamental analysis